May I yeah, hand over to Professor Karen Volkman for her talk on spaces of graphs. Karen Volkman is a professor at the University of Warwick and specializes in moduli spaces of graphs and cat zero structures and their connections with other areas of mathematics, physics, and biology. Um, Karen has received lots of honors amongst those. The Polya Prize, the LMS Polya Prize in 2018 for a profound and pioneering work in geometric group theory, particularly the study of automorphisms groups of three groups. And in May 2021, Karen was elected Fellow of the Royal Society. Um, internationally, she gave an ICM lecture, an invita invited ICM lecture in 2006 in Madrid, the annual AWM Noether lecture in 2007. She's a fellow of the American Math Society since 2012, has received the Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award and the Humboldt, hum Humboldt Research Award, both in 2014. And she's an MSRI Clay Senior Scholar and Simons Professor. And she gave a plenary talk at the ECM in Berlin. And only this year, she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So, um, let me please um, welcome Karen. Thank you. Um, <laughs> am, I, am I on? Yes. Okay, good, great. Uh, so thank you, uh, Britta, for the introduction, and thanks the, to the LMS and uh, the University of Copenhagen for uh, having me give this lecture. Um, right, so I'm supposed to address a general audience. I, when I was invited to give the lecture, I was supposed to address a general audience, and now I'm faced with an audience of topologists and geometers. So we'll see how this goes. But the title of my talk is uh, Spaces of Graphs. So what's the story? I, I once went to a, a workshop hosted by, run by Alan Alda which said that uh, if you give a talk of any sort, to any sort of audience, there has to be a story. And a story has to have a protagonist and it has to have a goal. And I was kind of struggling uh, with the protagonist and the goal here, but uh, my story is I'm gonna talk about a space called outer space and lots of its relatives. And so those are the spaces of, of graphs in the title of my talk. And my goal is to draw some connections with various fields of mathematics and sciences. So instead of a single story, this is kind of uh, a series of um, short stories, short stories instead of a big story. Okay, so what do I mean by spaces of graphs? First, I want to tell you what I mean by a graph. So to me, a graph is a bunch of vertices that are connected by, so it's a one-dimensional cell complex. The zero cells are uh, points, and the, there's one cells that connect them. So my graphs are allowed to have multi, um, multiple edges and loops. And there's certain of the edges that are only connected to one zero cell and those I'm not going to call edges. Those are special. They're going to be called leaves. Make them green so that they're right. So these are leaves. It's only one leaf. And uh, the other edges, the, the other one cells that are in the interior, those are called edges. So there's two edges. So the graphs I'm going to talk about today are going to be admissible. What I mean by admissible is like the graph I've drawn here. They're connected, and they don't have any bivalent vertices. And the reason for that, well, there's two reasons. One, I'm basically a topologist, and uh, if I put bivalent vertices in there, it doesn't change the homeomorphism type of the graph, so I don't really 
want them. I don't need them. The other reason is I'm going to make some spaces, and if I allow bivalent vertices, my spaces won't be finite dimensional, but I want finite dimensional spaces. So the other thing about my graphs, my invisible graphs, is I'm actually going to label the leaves with numbers, one, two. Actually, I can label them with anything. Numbers are convenient labels. OK, so that's the kind of graph I'm going to talk about, admissible graphs with labeled leaves. OK, not only that, but my graphs will almost always, maybe today they'll always be finite. So that means there's a finite number of zero cells, a finite number of one cells, and a finite number, uh, I should say, there's a finite number of vertices, a finite number of edges, and a finite number of leaves. So the fundamental group is a basic group that's associated to a topological space. If I have a finite connected graph, the fundamental group is a finitely generated free group. And there's one graph, uh, what I'm going to call the standard graph, that uh, I'm going to associate very closely with this finitely generated free group. So there's a graph with, le with uh, one vertex. Well, it's got three leaves, one vertex and a bunch of uh, loops. The loops are labeled A1, A2, up to AN. And the leaves, as always, are labeled 1, 2, up to S. So this is R, N, S. It's going to call that a standard graph. It's a thorned rose. It's a rose that's got these little spikes coming out the bottom. Um, so the fundamental group of R, N, S is going to be canonically identified with the free group on the leaves. So that's a free group of rank n. And it's clear how the correspondence goes. If I have a word in those letters, I just uh, trace around the loop according to the word. So I think I just drew a n, a 2, a squared, and a 1. OK, so that's my graphs. Um, that's my standard graph. Now I want to talk about metric graphs. So in this context, a metric graph isn't exactly a metric space. It's, uh, it's going to be a finite graph. And I'm going to put positive real lengths on all of the edges. So remember, leaves aren't edges. So I'm not going to put lengths on the leaves, just on the edges. So um, yeah, there's a graph. I'll put 1 half, 1 half, 1 on all the edges, but I won't put any length on the leaf. And if I take my graph and scale it, make it little like that, I'm not going to, I'm going to consider that to be the same graph. It's an, uh, so I can, I can choose a representative of each equivalence class by saying, well, let's just make the sum of the edge lengths equal to 1. So I'm going to normalize. So the sum of the edge lengths is equal to 1. OK, so hmm, you know what? I'm working on the wrong file. Yeah. Excuse me. Right. You weren't supposed to see the next lines yet. <laughs> OK, so we have this picture of the scaling graph. That's the same graph, and the sum of the edge lengths is equal to 1 is a way to choose one, one graph from all the, the set. OK, so ta-da. Um, MGNS is now the set of all graphs with uh, admissible metric graphs with fundamental group Fn and S labeled leaves. This is a set at this point. And what I want to do is make it into a space, a uh, topological space. So how do I do this? Well, I'm going to do this 
uh, first in the two extreme cases. First case is when there's no loops, when n equals zero, the rank of the, fun of the free group is zero, and the second case when uh, the graph has no leaves, and then I'm gonna talk about how, what you do in general. So let's start with uh, the case where there aren't any, uh, the fundamental group is trivial. So what's x then? x is a tree. Now remember I said the sum of the edge lengths is equal to one. So I better have at least one internal edge. So right now, this is not allowed. That just has leaves, it doesn't have any edges. So uh, it has to have at least one edge and it has to have at least four vertices because all the vertices have to be at least trivalent. So for example, if S is equal to four, then there's a graph. Here's another graph. And here's another graph. And the middle edge length, the edge has length one and all those points, that's all. That's all the graphs there are with all the admissible finite metric graphs with four leaves. So my space, MG04, is three points. Okay. So that was easy, so uh, let's move up and make S, S equal to five. Here's a graph with five leaves. One, two, three, four, five. And now I have two lengths to play with, L1 and L2. The sum of them has to be equal to one. Well, I can model that by a simplex. Uh, L1 plus L2 is equal to one, and I'm gonna call that simplex uh, sigma of x. So sigma of x is that simplex. Notice, so this is the L1 axis, this is the L2 axis. If I have L2 equal to, uh, whoops, those are both L1. If I make L2 equal to zero, I get something that looks like that. Okay, um, uh, it's got labels on the leaves. One, two, three, four, five. There's also, I can also look at a different graph that looks like this. One, two, th whoops, one, two, three, four, five. It's also got two interior edges, L1 and L2. And so I also get another simplex, which I'm gonna draw the axes like that out of perversity, and there's also a simplex sigma of y. But notice if L2 is equal to zero, that's exactly the same graph as that. So in fact, I can make a space by just, by identifying sigma of x, I can make a bigger space by identifying sigma of x with sigma of y like that. Okay, so this admissibility condition that I s said um, means that there's only gonna be a finite number of possibilities for a graph with five leaves. And I can see from what I've done here that um, it's gonna be a one-dimensional space. It's gonna be ma made out of these simplices glued together along faces that they agree on so, in fact, you can check that the whole space looks like this. So that's a famous graph called the Peterson graph. And if I collapse a maximal tree, this is actually a homotopy equivalent to a wedge of six spheres, six circles. Okay, so that's um, what MG05 looks like. And it's 
a theorem. It's not too hard to prove. It's been reproved in several places in history, including by me, without knowing anybody else did it. Uh, and the theorem is that uh, the space for any number of leaves is always homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres. You can even count how many there are. They're s minus 1 factorial of them, and uh, they're four mi s minus 4 dimensional. Okay, so that's, that's the space that I wanted to make for n equals 0. Now, I want to tell you why, what this space is good for. Um, so this, this fact that the, homotope, that the thing's a wedge of spheres means that uh, if you look at uh, its homology, what you get, we, I claim you're going to get a, a nice representation, namely uh, the symmetric group acts on graphs with labeled leaves by permuting the labels. So therefore, it acts on this space I just made. It permutes these simplices that I just made. And uh, so it acts, it, it acts on the space, so it also acts on the homology of the space. So the homology of the space is, uh, there's only one interesting non-trivial homology dimension, namely s minus 4. So that's a vector space. And this uh, space was, uh, so this, this is a representation of the symmetric group, and it turns out to be a very interesting representation uh, that uh, Whitehouse and Robinson uh, looked at, studied. They kind of dissected it and in 1996, and in their paper they say it's related to E infinity structures and homotopy theory, configuration spaces, and partition lattices among other things. I believe there's a survey article by Fred Cohen that mentions these things. So that's nice. What else can we use it for? Well, this is a, in a completely different direction. Uh, a phylogenetic tree, this is a picture from Wikipedia, is a, gene, a, a tree that relates species by, uh, genetically. So biologists are interested in studying uh, how closely related different species are, so they make these trees. Um, but of course, it's just a tree. This is just what we've been talking about. In, in fact, it's a tree with labeled leaves. I, I should, they, they forgot to label this guy. This guy's an amoeba. OK? Um, in, for phylogenetic trees, you actually care what the lengths of these edges are. It shows how, what the distance is between species. So you kind of want to, so I, I, was, uh, I was normalizing so the sum of the edge lengths is equal to 1. Biologists don't want to do that. So what they're really doing is taking the cone on, this, on the space that we just defined. And um, the cone point is the, the tree with no edges. So uh, this is known as BHV tree space these days, and it's uh, quite popular among uh, bio evolutionary biologists. Uh, and the point of this space is that after you cone off this MG0S, what you get is a space with a metric of non-positive curvature. So what you're doing in, in biology is you have this bunch of species. You're trying to see how they're related. You run various genes that are common to the species through your computer, and they give you different trees. So how, which tree is the real tree? Well, I, the different trees give me points in this tree space, and what I do is try to find a, some sort of a center. Now, in a non-positively curved space, you can do this. There are various ways of, of defining what a center should be. So, or, it, uh, or you would call this a consensus tree. Um, right, so anyway, you can do statistics on this space. OK, so that's enough for uh, trees. Let's go to the other extreme, where the graphs don't have any leaves. So x has no leaves. Um, yeah. So 
you want to do the same thing. You want to make simplices co uh, uh, corresponding to the, the um, uh, making to, to the various graphs and glue them together along common faces. But let's look at an example. If n equals two, uh, this is maybe one third and two thirds. Some of the edge lengths is equal to one. So you think that you should get there's two edge lengths, L1 and L2. You should get uh, a simplex like that. But there's a problem. Um, there's nothing that says I had to draw this graph in the plane this way. I could have also drawn it uh, that way. That's the same graph. It's, uh, this is one third and two thirds. In other words, the point over here is exactly the same as the point over here. So in fact, you don't actually get this whole simplex. You just get half of the simplex. OK, that's very annoying. But there's a solution. Uh, right, this is the problem. You only get half of the simplex. It's going to be very hard to understand what this space is. But the solution is to mark your graph by a homotopy equivalence. So what do I mean? Um, let's see, what do I mean? Right. Let me take a simple example. Here's my, my uh, so a homotopy uh, marking <coughs> is a homotopy equivalence from R and S. In this case, there's no leaves. So remember, this has two labels. I'll call them A and B instead. And I've got my funny graph like that. And if it's marked, that means there's some homotopy equivalence from the standard rows to my graph. Um, I'm going to make the simplest possible one to illustrate my point. Say A goes around that way, and B goes around that way. OK, now that is not equal anymore to the one where A got big. Th by the left, left loop got big, and the blue, group, blue, blue loop got uh, small. Right? A goes around the wrong edge. It's not the same graph, because I marked it. This is the A loop. The A loop's, a loop's the little one. And this one, the A loop's the big one. So I get an open simplex now. I get a perfectly good simplex. But I have to write not only the x, but the marking. Interesting thing about this simplex, it's an open simplex. This is very important. I can't actually collapse the, uh, say, the blue loop to 0, because if I do, this fundamental group isn't uh, rank 2 anymore. So it's an open simplex. OK, so again, I want to glue simplices together if they have a common marked face. That's going to be hard to see in uh, the example I've done, because there's no, there's no faces on these simplices. But if I take a slightly bigger example, I'll get a three-dimensional simplex, L1, L2, and L3. I can make L1 go to 0, and I get a perfectly good uh, one simplex. If this was L1. And now I can glue this. So, my, so remember, I need a marking. So maybe A went around that way on this one, and B went around that way. Uh, there's another simplex that looks almost exactly the same. Uh, let me draw this like. So I'm going through this in some detail, because if you understand this, you underst you're going to understand everything. Um, right, so that corresponded to this graph, but on the left. 
And there's, I claim there's another simplex that looks just like this, except that uh, B goes around, whoops, B was blue, goes around that way. And this one, B went around that way. And when I uh, crush the middle edge, the graphs are actually, it uh, doesn't matter which way I put the arrow on the blue edge, it's the same graph. So this is actually, there's another simplex here, uh, which is the one that I've drawn there. Okay. So now you can see now I can make a space. And in 1986, Mark Culler and I proved that the space you make by gluing the simplices together in this, fam in this way is a contractible space. And uh, there's a picture of it for n equals 2. I just drew you the picture of that simplex and that simplex. There's another one uh, coming out as well. OK. So and I'm going to talk now about various ways to modify this space and get something that's interesting. Um, but it's easier to, to draw the pictures if I look straight down on the space instead of looking sideways, in which if I look straight down, I won't be able to see any of those yellow triangles. So you just have to remember that they're there. The space is not a manifold, uh, even though in this picture it looks like it is. OK, so that's what it looks like. Now, this, 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 space, uh, this uh, space I've just made, it's made by gluing together simplices, but it's not a simplicial complex because it's missing faces. So there are several ways to, uh, it's nice to work with, with simplicial complexes or cell complexes. So there are several ways to remedy this. The easiest thing is just to add the missing spaces. And that gives you something called the simplicial closure, CVN star. And the act, uh, yeah, right. Uh, another thing you can do if you don't like the fact that uh, it has missing faces is just cut them off. So you have to do this a little bit carefully. It's very easy in this case. There, I cut them off. So the simplex in the beginning, in the middle, that used to be a triangle, has now become a hexagon. And in general, what happens is the simplex sigma of xg becomes a, what's called a graph polytope. And so you, have a, you now have a nice cell complex where the cells are graph polytopes. So there's a different graph polytope for different graphs. But, um, and you have to be careful if they're large dimensional, you have to cut off the missing faces in a clever way so that uh, you don't destroy the information about the, just, uh, about the missing faces, which means you have to cut deeper if you've uh, collapsed more pieces of your graph. OK. Right. There's even more things you can do to this space. There's also a space inside of, of this space called the spine of outer space. So what you just do is you, you take your finger and you push in from all those missing faces until your, your fingers start hitting each other. And what you get is what's left after you push in from, the, from infinity is called the spine of outer space. Uh, so none of the spaces that I've just defined, that I've just made by worrying about the missing faces is actually a compact space. Uh, Katie showed us that it's really nice to have compact spaces and understand what happens at infinity, but there's actually also a compactification, CVN bar. This is a picture of what it looks like from straight above. Uh, you'll notice that the pink stuff is the stuff you have to add to compactify. You'll notice it's not a nice circle like the things that Katie was drawing. It's, uh, in fact, it's not in Katie's zoo, I don't believe. But uh, nevertheless, you can use it to, to uh, right, we'll see how you can use it. I haven't told you what, what the space is good for yet. 
Uh, here's, here's a picture uh, with, the, with the spaces in. So these pictures were drawn by Kurt McMullen many years ago. Okay, so what's this good for? Well, I claim this is good for group theory. I have this really nice space. It has a really nice action of the group of outer automorphisms of a free group. So what, how do you get this? Well, this marking from the, rows, from the rows to your graph induces a map on the fundamental group. So it gives you an isomorphism of the free group with the fundamental group. So if you have an, isomor an automorphism of the free group, that's going to give you a different isomorphism. So all I do, I'm not going to change my graph. I'm just going to change the way it's, it's, it's uh, identified with the free group. Its fundamental group is identified with the free group. So the way that works is if you have uh, a point in, in the space, that then, uh, and you have an automorphism of the free group, you can realize that by a map on the space called F alpha. And you just compose G with F alpha. And you get a new marked uh, new point in, in this space. So XG dot alpha is XG composed with X alpha. OK, so that's, uh, so there's a group that acts on this space. And it's an interesting group. If you think about the stabilizer of a point, well, think about the stabilizer of this point that I drew. That's the same point as I can just flip either one of those edges. Let's flip the B edge. Whoops, flip the B edge, which is blue, because it's B. And that's the same graph just drawn in the, in the um, same graph, same marking. It's just drawn in the plane differently. In fact, the, the stabilizer of a point is just uh, the group of isometries of the graph, which is a finite group. And back to my original space that I started to try to define, if I take the quotient of this space that I just made by the group action, what I get is um, the moduli space of graphs, mg n0. So we have a space, we have an action. It's a contractible space. Uh, did I say that? Yeah, it's contractible. And uh, the, the stabilizers are finite. So you can use this space and all of its variants to study out of F, Fn. So now, by now, this was, uh, right, this space was kind of first set out in 1986. By now, there's a huge literature on how you use this space to study out of Fn. Milan Bestvina is one of the major players in this story. He's giving a plenary talk on Sunday, which I encourage you all to go to. Um, he uses a lot the, the ideas that, uh, the circle of ideas that Katie was talking about, uh, about studying this group by studying its action on this stuff at infinity. Uh, so why is this space? So I'd like to point out that uh, th this, this spine is also very interesting because modulo the action, the spine is actually a finite CW complex. So it's quasi-isometric to the group. So if you're a geometric group theorist, you can study quasi-isometry invariants of the spine, and you get invariants of group. And algebraic topologists maybe are more interested in the fact that uh, the space is contractible with finite stabilizers. So the homology of this quotient space is the rational group homology of the group, which is also an invariant. And that's actually what I spend most of my time thinking about is, is homology these days. OK, so now you're all primed to do, uh, I can talk about uh, graphs that have both loops and leaves uh, in one slide. So I'm going to look at the space of marked graphs with fundamental group Fn and S leaves. And they're labeled 1 to S. And so what do I have to do? Uh, a marking is now just a homotopy equivalence from my standard rows. Uh, 
standard thorned rose. To right, remember my a point looks like well it's got uh, rank three I guess and uh, three leaves. That's a point in MG. Uh, right, CV three three. Okay, so as before. I get uh, an open simplex associated to this marked metric graph. Remember, these guys have lengths on the edges. Uh, you get open simplices, and you glue them together along common faces. Same thing we did before. And uh, Hatcher, in 1995, proved that these spaces are contractible, too, uh, for all n bigger than or equal to 2. n equals 1 is a special case. We also understand that very well. but in the interest of time, I'm not going to tell you much about it. So there's also a group that acts on this space, the space of marked things that, that changes the marking. What's the group? It's homotopy. It's a label-preserving homotopy equivalences of the, this standard rows that fix all the leaves. Uh, and that's homotopy equivalence is up to homotopy. And then the, the quotient space is the moduli space of graphs with marked points. It's sometimes called that. And there's also a simplicial closure, a bordification, and a spine, all of those things. So what can we use these spaces for? What was the, what's, what's, the, what's the good of adding leaves as well as loops? Well, one good thing, one thing you can use it for, even if you're interested in graphs with no leaves, is if you can figure out things about homology of graphs of, of s with small number of loops, you can use that to figure out stuff about the homology of graphs with more loops. So the idea is that if you have a graph that doesn't have any leaves, there's a random graph with no leaves. People who know this will can laugh. I can, uh, so that's x. I can cut it along those three uh, edges and get two graphs that do have leaves. And as long as I label the leaves, I can get back x by gluing x1 and x2 together. The labels tell me how. OK, so, so what? If I have a homotopy equivalence of the left-hand graph that fixes the leaves and a homotopy equivalence of the right-hand graph that fixes the leaves, I can stick them together and get a homotopy equivalence of the whole graph that fixes the leaves. And I can do that because they fix the leaves. OK. So. These homotopy equivalences on the pieces assembled give me a homotopy equivalence on the whole thing. So if you think about what that means in terms of these groups, I have the groups, well, I just have uh, this, is, this is where G1 lives. This is where G2 lives. And uh, then sticking them together, I get an element of A, N, S. This is where G lives. So I have a group homomorphism. And if I have a group homomorphism, I can get a map on homology. I'm going to take trivial rational coefficients. So the, the map on homology is just going to be, did I write it down? No. Uh, homology of A, N1, S1 tensor homology of A N2 S2 goes to the homology of A N S. So if I know a homology class here, and I know a homology class here, I can take, I can look at their tensor product, and I can get a potential homology class over there. So if I'm interested in homology, 
I can assemble classes together and get homology from the pieces. Uh, degenerations of Riemann surfaces. So the space of graphs, all of these spaces of graphs have recently been become into vogue uh, by, with, by tropical algebraic geometers. They call them the moduli spaces of tropical curves. And tropical curves measure degenerations of Riemann surfaces. So if I take some uh, Riemann surface and start pinching some curves, to points, what I get uh, uh, dual to this picture, those points, those uh, red curves will become points and dual to this, uh, I guess I could do it. What I'm going to get is something that has a dual graph. And there's a metric on the graph corresponding to the rates that I'm pinching the curves as I go to infinity. Okay, so I'm not going to say much about this. Um, as I say, that this has been intensively studied by tropical algebraic geometers, and Chan and Galatius and Payne have a couple of really nice papers in, written in 2015 and 2019, and maybe there's more papers than that. I'm not quite sure. Um, that's all I could find on the archive. The, so there's the expert. You can talk to him. Uh, okay, so... Now let's go somewhere else. What else can you use these spaces for? Let's try perturbative quantum field theory. Okay, uh, this is a Feynman diagram. So uh, what's a Feynman diagram? Well, it describes a contribution to the amplitude of a scattering process. Uh, so you shoot some, some particles in with some momenta, they come out with some momenta, and you're trying to describe what happened in the middle and this uh, describes something that might have happened. And what you do in perturbative quantum field theory is you add up the contributions to all of these possible, what, what could have possibly happened on the inside, and uh, that's a number that you care about. I'm just going to say that. So each contribution is, is uh, obtained by integrating a dif differential form uh, on the simplex, sigma of x, that we've been talking about. Um, the, the differential form looks different on different simplices, but they fit together in a nice way to give a distribution on the whole moduli space of graphs with S sleeves. Uh, this integral is, uh, so this is explained in a very nice paper by Marco Berghoff in 2020. And uh, in, if you integrate this distribution on the whole moduli space of graphs, you get what's called the n-loop contribution to the amplitude. So actually, this is a lie. This, this uh, distribution that you write down, the integrals don't actually converge. Uh, they have to, so what physicists do is they adjust these integrals by renormalizing them. Um, so with that one, one way of describing how to do this is you subtract various expressions from the integrand, and if you subtract enough expressions in the right way, the integral is going to converge. And it turns out that these terms correspond to faces of the bordification. Remember those graph polytopes? The, board, the bordification was made up of all these graph polytopes glued together. If you look at the faces that were infinity, they keep track of what happened uh, as you went to infinity, and they, they uh, organize uh, the renormalization process in physics. And this also is in this paper of Burkhoff's, which I like to advertise. Uh, yeah, that's a technical point. We don't need to worry about that. So in the last uh, few minutes, I want to talk about some very recent stuff. Um, so we've been talking about different, I've just put differential forms on, on moduli spaces of graphs. There's very recent work by Francis Brown. And what he does is he exploits a natural map from CVN to the symmetric space of positive definite quadratic forms uh, to 
So now I'm going to explain a little bit. How do you get a map from CVN to the space of quadratic forms? So given a marked graph, that's a, a graph with a homotopy equivalence, uh, I need to produce a quadratic form. Well, this is very easy. The first homology of my graph is the kernel of the boundary map from the one cells to the zero cells. Uh, the identity quadratic form on the vector space spanned by the one cells, well, that restricts to a positive definite, that's a positive definite quadratic form, so it restricts to a positive definite quadratic form on any subspace, in particular on the first homology. So now we have a, a positive definite quadratic form on the first homology, and uh, the marking identifies the first homology with r to the n. That's the induced map on homology. So I've given a marked graph, I've produced a positive definite quadratic form on r to the n, and that's the map. So it's easy to check that this map uh, is equivariant with respect to the map from out of Fn to GLNZ. So out of Fn acts on the space of CVN, and GLNZ acts on the space of positive definite quadratic forms, and we have this map, and the map commutes with the action. Uh, so it descends to a map on the quotients if you prefer looking at the quotient. So what does is, what is Brown do? He pulls back uh, various differential forms using this map, and then he proves uh, a kind of a Stokes theorem for the forms that he pulls back. And the, the Stokes theorem relies on the structure of these graph polytopes, in other words, the bordification of out of Fn, of, of CVN. Now, Burrell computed the stable homology of the general linear group GLNZ in 1974 in terms of differential forms on the space of quadratic forms, equivariant forms on the space of quadratic forms. So there are certain quadratic, certain differential forms that give you classes that generate the stable homology of GLNZ. They're called Burrell classes. And Brown uses these to uh, find new cohomology classes in Konsevich's graph complex. So what does this have to do with outer space? Well, there's also a very close connection between outer space and Konsevich's graph complex. So Konsevich defined three kinds of um, graph complexes. He defined these completely algebraically as uh, the uh, chain complexes associated to a certain infinite dimensional Lie algebra. The cohomology of these complexes is a Hopf algebra, and the primitive parts generated by subcomplexes spanned by connected graphs with a fixed Euler characteristic. So there we go, graphs. So this algebraically defined chain complex has got to have something to do with outer space, right? Well, uh, it does. The, uh, the subcomplexes, Konsevich's chain complexes, are very closely related to CVN. So let me just do the uh, commutative graph complex. So that can be identified with the chains on the simplicial closure modulo the subcomplex at infinity. So that was the simplicial closure. The subcomplex at infinity is, is um, indicated in green. Those are all the faces that weren't actually in outer space. They're just, uh, but you had to add them to get a simplicial complex. So if you take this chain complex, this relative chain complex, uh, chains at CV, at uh, the simplicial closure modulo the stuff at infinity, and uh, look at the equivariant stuff, tensor mod out by the action of out of Fn, you get Konsevich's uh, commutative graph complex. Uh, yeah. That's it. <laughs>
Um, the other, uh, Kansevich's other complexes, they're also closely related to, to uh, outer space. Mm -hmm. The Lee graph complex is equivalent to the equivariant chains on the spine. So remember, that's the spine. And if I just take the chains on the spine and tensor out by the action, I get the uh, Lee graph complex. Well, I don't get the Lee graph complex. I get something quasi-isometric to it, quasi-isomorphic to it. Same homology. Um, and I'm going to skip the associative graph complex. Uh, yeah, but that's also related. OK, so I just wanted to end with uh, a couple of comments. This talk was all about why spaces of graphs are interesting. Um, and they in pr they've been especially useful for studying out of FN and moduli spaces of surfaces. But there's a whole lot more that we don't know. So I wanted to end on stuff we don't know. So I told you that these spaces are contractible. They're all contractible for n equals 2. There are wedge of spheres for n equals 0. And actually, we know exactly what they are for n equals 1, 2. But this quotients, after you mod out by the action, those are very far from being contractible. They have interesting cohomology, which uh, that's related to the cohomology of mapping class groups out of Fn, GLNZ, and Kansevich's graph homology. But we don't know much about this, this cohomology. For instance, there's a beautiful series of explicit classes in 4K dimensions for graphs with no leaves called Merida classes. So they're very easy to describe. Uh, they're all conjectured to be non-zero, but this has only been proved for the first three classes. Notice that Merida classes, you can generalize the Merida classes somewhat, but whenever you do, you're always going to get even dimensional classes. But recent results by Michi Berinsky and myself on the Euler characteristic of this space, Mg n0, show that in fact the amount of odd dimensional cohomology grows factorially with n. So a, few year, a couple of years ago, we proved that uh, the rational Euler characteristic grows factorially, but now we know the actual Euler characteristic for those who know the difference between those two. One's an orbifold Euler characteristic, and one's an actual orbifold Euler, yeah, Euler characteristic. However, only one non-trivially odd-dimensional class has ever been found. It was found by Laurent Bartholdi in 2016 after a conference organized by uh, the people at Copenhagen um, in which I talked about cohomology of these spaces. And he went and got his computer out and found a, found a class. That's one. The number grows factorially with n. So I have a question. Where does all this odd cohomology come from? And how is it related to the cohomology of uh, related groups. And finally, uh, I didn't tell you much about, didn't tell you anything about how to prove any of the theorems that I mentioned. Uh, I have a list of techniques that have been used to study outer, outer space, uh, out of Fn, moduli spaces of graphs. It's a long list. The point is that if you, under, if I've convinced, if I've communicated what these spaces are. They're simple spaces. If you have some tools that could be useful for understanding what these spaces are, go to it. Um, we've got a lot of questions that are still open that we'd like answers to. So this is an invitation to, uh, to both ask your own questions and find your own answers. So that's the end of my talk. Actually, I'm, one, more, one more slide. That's a picture of outer space in rank two by Jos Lays, which I like. It's got stars in it.
Yeah. And then you said general, you get a wedge, such a, such a body. A wedge of spheres. Yeah. Do you know exactly what you get for the power? Is it one type of type? Uh, w- w- you have a description of what the axis yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, you can, it's, well, it's homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres. Right. You can, you can, um, you can pick out the spheres. You can describe the spheres in terms of certain trees. They're basically linear trees with uh, things, yeah, they're linear trees. And if you look at all the, tr- uh, let's see, yeah, I can describe exactly what, I can describe a sphere inside this, this uh, space, and these, I know that these spheres generate the homology. Yeah. Oh. 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 I see. Is there some? Uh, is, is the answer some sort of a? Uh, yeah. I don't know that the these spaces have any better, any other description than the space of trees. Yes. This this picture. So I should say this picture. These pictures of outer space and dimension two I've drawn are somewhat misleading. I've drawn pictures of the hyperbolic plane, right? But um, the only reason I did that there, there's no natural. There's well, there is a metric on on outer space which I didn't describe, but it's not that metric. Uh, outer space does not have a hyperbolic metric in general. So the, the picture was drawn because all of the triangles in outer space fit in a finite slide, right? If you, if you stick them like that. You should imagine all of those things as being, for instance, equilateral Euclidean, Euclidean triangles, just drawn that way. There are also other metrics on the space that, that are nice but a little more complicated to describe. Yeah, well, you get an action, yeah, you get different graphs. <laughs> um, I mean, you can, so you, you cut, after you cut them, you have to have rules, you have to decide how to reattach them. And uh, that's actually understanding what can happen, what you can get by reattaching is part of what goes on in this calculation of the Euler characteristic, yeah. That's true. Thank you. 